He'd uh, like a half percent pay increase starting March 27th. Rule debate to bet today, but that gets underway at 1.30. Live coverage of the House on C-SPAN. The House will be in order, and the prayer today will be offered by our chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. As we meditate on all the blessings of life, we especially pray for the blessing of peace in our lives and in our world. Our fervent prayer, O oh God, is that people will learn to live together in reconciliation and respect so that the terrors of war and of dictatorial abuse will be no more. As you have created each person, we pray that you guide our hearts and minds that every person of every place and background might focus on your great gift of life and so learn to live in unity. May your special blessings be upon the members of this assembly in the important, sometimes difficult work they do. Give them wisdom and charity that they might work together for the common good. May all that is done this day in the people's house be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the house her approval thereof. And pursuant to clause one of rule one, the journal stands approved. The pledge today will be led by the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair will entertain up to 15 requests for one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina seek recognition? And the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, in February 2009, Corporal Kyle Carpenter, a constituent and resident of Lexington, South Carolina, enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and went on to complete recruit training at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot at Paris Island, South Carolina. A little over a year later, Corporal Carpenter was deployed to Marjah, Afghanistan, with his unit to carry out his service and protect our families in Operation Enduring Freedom. On November 21, 2010, Corporal Carpenter suffered devastating injuries when an enemy hand grenade exploded while he was on post. Because of his heroic actions, Corporal Carpenter potentially saved the lives of countless others and has been decorated with a Purple Heart and awarded the Combat Action Ribbon. I have had the privilege of visiting with Kyle, his mother Robin, and father Jim throughout his recovery with the dedicated staff at Walter Reed at Bethesda. Kyle has served as a testament to hard work and valor. Today, Kyle is an intern serving with Chairman Jeff Miller of the Veterans Affairs Committee. I have no doubt that because of Corporal Carpenter's service, American families are more secure. I want to thank Kyle and the Carpenter family for your dedication to our nation. In conclusion, God bless our troops, and we will never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. Gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? And the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, when I first came to Congress, I didn't vote for that bill that created the threat of sequestration. Uh, I thought it was a bad idea then. I think it's a bad idea now. Automatic triggers uh, that institute automatic cuts across the board in spending in this country uh, are a bad idea. This man-made crisis uh, is now threatening both our nation's economy and our national security. Here's just a couple ways that that would happen. 10% of the FAA FAA's workforce of 40,000 would be furloughed on any given day, resulting in reduced air traffic controllers, longer delays, and economic losses for air transportation and tourism. Less tra air traffic controllers means fewer flights, 
which means less tourism, and that means fewer jobs in hotels and restaurants, a ripple effect that could cripple our economy. The Coast Guard would be cut by nearly 25 percent, jeopardizing maritime and navigation safety, the safe flow of commerce along U.S. waterways, and drastically reduce our ability to fight drug trafficking. The clock is ticking once again. We cannot take our economy and our safety backwards at a time when the American people have worked to build it up. Let's act now to get rid of this terrible sequestration. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alaska seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, this is an injustice that the Secretary of uh, Interior and the Fish and Wildlife have done to a village called King Cove in Alaska. We had the hearings, we had the lands transfer, we had everything going to work so these people could be safe. Be safe to go to hospitals, be safe to fly out when the weather was bad. It was an agreement between the state, the Congress, and the village of King Cove. And along comes the Fish and Wildlife and denies them the trade that has to be necessary for this transportation corridor. I'm urging my senators to put a hold on the new Secretary of Interior so she's not confirmed until this secretary can, in fact, sign the law to allow them to have safety for once and for all. This process has been going on for more than 20 years. We finally got to a solution. It's being stopped by this administration, the lack of knowledge about human life, and we'd rather protect something that does not exist. This refuge has over 300 miles of road in it, but these people are being denied and need the safety. I'm asking the Secretary Solars, in fact, to take and do his job, overturn the Fish and Life recommendation, allow my people to be safe, make sure they can continue to live their lives without the threat of the weather when it can be solved by an act of the Secretary. Thank you. For what uh, purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, two years ago today, the people of Bahrain took to the streets in peaceful protests. They called for democratic freedoms and an end to human rights abuses. The government of Bahrain responded with violence. It attacked protesters, killing more than 30, and imprisoned and tortured thousands of others. Even doctors who treated protesters were arrested, tortured, and prosecuted. Two years later, the situation has not improved. In fact, it may be getting worse. More protesters have died, hundreds of political prisoners remain in jail, and authorities responsible for the use of torture remain free. Despite an active public relations campaign, the government of Bahrain is not, and I repeat, is not making a good faith effort uh, to meet the legitimate demands of its people. The Obama administration needs to change course with Bahrain and begin implementing a policy that holds Bahrain accountable and promotes democratic freedoms so that we are not here again saying these same things on the third anniversary of the protests. I yield back my balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Ask the unanimous consent that I be allowed to address the House for one minute. The gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise on the occasion of Honor Flight Northern Colorado's ninth flight to Washington, D.C., bringing veterans of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam to see their memorials. On behalf of a grateful delegation, state, and country, I welcome these heroes. The 122 veterans on this flight included 37 from World War II, 80 from the Korea conflict, 4 from the Vietnam War, and 1 from the war in Iraq. Eight of these veterans wear the Purple Heart. The Honor Flight program was founded in 2005. It provides veterans with the opportunity to visit Washington, D.C., free of any cost to them or their families to see the memorials that were built in their honor. The program originally intended to honor World War II veterans has developed to include veterans from several major conflicts. Today, we honor those v veterans as they make the journey to Washington to visit the memorials that serve as a symbol of a grateful nation. Of course, no memorial, no statue can ever truly convey the sacrifices our veterans have made for our country. Much has been asked of these soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen, and time and time again, they have delivered. The freedoms endowed upon us by our Creator, protected by our Constitution, and enjoyed by all Americans must never be taken for granted. Today, we honor those who have sacrificed to secure the blessings of liberty for generations of Americans. And I have a statement that I ask unanimous consent be submitted to the record. Without objection. And please join me in thanking these patriots, and I yield back my time. For what purpose is the gentleman from Oregon? Seek recognition. The gentleman's recognized. Sequester.
Well, that's an inside the beltway jargon. It means stupid, indiscriminate, across the board budget cuts. Cut things that are valuable, Coast Guard rescue, and cut things that are obsolete and unneeded. Registration for a draft that doesn't exist, the same percent. Now, the Republicans are pointing fingers, but I think the finger is going to get pointed right back at them. They're calling it the Obama Quester? Come on now, you've got to be kidding. Don't they remember their tax pledge to Grover Norquist that has forever bound them to starving the federal government of revenue? Now look where that got us when they threatened a default on the debt. It got us the sequester. They refused to compromise and forced us into another self-made arbitrary crisis. No, it's not an Obama quester. It's a Grover Norquester. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, as the sun was rising in the Iraqi desert, three dozen mortars rained down on Camp Liberty. Camp Liberty is where innocent Iranian exiles, including women and children, live. This unprovoked attack left six people dead and dozens wounded. Now, who was responsible? Was it the Iraqis, the Iranians? Looks to me like both governments should be held accountable. These dissidents stand for an Iran free of the extreme mullahs and the tyrant Ahmadinejad. Over 3,000 unarmed freedom fighters currently live at Camp Liberty and remain in imminent danger. The Iraqi government has proven on more than one occasion it is unwilling to protect Iranian dissidents in this country. The United Nations has a responsibility to ensure these people are moved to safer locations and even other countries. Not one more life should be stolen by those who protect the oppressive Iranian regime and the little fellow from the desert, Ahmadinejad. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? And the gentleman is recognized. I rise today to congratulate the New Haven Unified School District in Union City in the 15th Congressional District for being named one of 16 nationwide winners in the U.S. Department of Education's Race to the Top grant program. The district will receive over $29 million in funding, which will provide training and equipment to support the outstanding students, teachers, and staff of New Haven Unified. This is a tremendous achievement, and I am proud of the school superintendent, Carrie McVeigh, and school board members, Linda Conless, Jonas Dino, Michael Ricci, Sarah Jeep Chima, and Michelle Matthews, who had the good sense and worked hard to apply for this competitive grant. I know the 13,000 students from New Haven Unified will benefit from the technology and educational improvements in their schools. In Union City, this critical funding will help to expand after-school programs, student support, and access to health care for the most vulnerable students, and will provide teachers with training and techniques needed to improve our classrooms. I am proud to represent New Haven Unified, Union City, students, educators, and administrators, and look forward to hearing of their many successes. And Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana seek recognition? The gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, this week, President Obama outlined his vision for America. Job-killing tax hikes, a job-killing national energy tax, job-killing wage controls, and job-killing stimulus spending. Equally telling were the items that the President did not mention. He offered no plan to pay off our $16 trillion of debt, no plan to replace the sequester cuts to national defense that he proposed, no plan to save our broken social safety nets, and no plan to restore the confidence of Americans in the real economy. President Obama believes that every problem can be solved with big government and another tax hike. President Clinton once declared that the era of big government is over. Not this president. President Obama believes more government is the solution to all of our problems. It's time to get this economy moving again. And my colleagues in the House are ready to work toward real solutions that encourage job growth, empower individuals, and break Washington's spending habits. Thank you, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey yeah, seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, if we face yet another fiscal cliff in two weeks, it is imperative that this chamber produces a real solution to ward off a financial disaster that could deeply impact the American people. The idea behind sequestration was to create a worst-case scenario that was so severe that both sides 
that will put both sides to work together and find a balanced approach to passing a realistic budget reducing of our deficit. Instead of setting the stage for yet another battle to be resolved in the 11th hour, we should be focused on creating jobs and growing our economy. If sequestration goes forward, programs and services that millions of Americans rely on, like Head Start, supplemental nutrition program like the WIC program, and even FEMA would be decimated by drastic cuts in our funding. Additionally, sequestration will slash critical support to police who keep our streets safe, our air traffic controllers who manage our skies, and food inspectors who ensure the food that we eat is safe. Instead of jeopardizing critical services to our citizens, we need to begin to work on an approach that will avoid sequestration while sensibly reducing our deficit. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Dakota seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I seek recognition to address the uh, Assembly for one minute. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute to the legacy of a treasured North Dakotan who touched the lives of his wonderful family and all who knew him. Dr. Ben Clayberg left this world for a better place on January 21st, my birthday. Ben earned many titles during his life. He was a surgeon, a U.S. Army private, a professor, and a passionate political leader. But above all, he was a healer and a diplomat who inspired those around him. Grand Forks, North Dakota will always remember Ben Clayburg. After serving his country in the U.S. Army as a flight surgeon, he established himself in Grand Forks as a trusted man in medicine and politics, two of his greatest passions. He served as North Dakota's Republican National Committeeman for 12 years and in 2004 was honored in becoming a presidential elector for George W. Bush. His picture hangs in the Hall of Fame at the Ronald Reagan Center in Bismarck, and the memory of his tremendous character will always be in the hearts of those who knew and loved him. May God bless Ben's memory, his wife Bev, and the Clayburg family, his greatest legacy. Madam Speaker, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I request unanimous consent to address the House in one minute. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I wish to honor Mr. Donald E. Devaney, retired, the first civilian provost marshal to be appointed by the United States Army. In March 1984, he assumed the position at Tripler Army Medical Center in Hawaii. During a nearly 30-year assignment at Tripler Army Medical Center, he established a provost marshal office and police department that gained great notoriety by many elements of the United States government and the local community during a time of uncertainty and many wartime missions. Through Mr. Devaney's leadership, the Tripler Provost Marshal Office has been recognized as a leading law enforcement and security department. Mr. Devaney's service as a federal employee is built upon a 30-year career in the Army. In 1953, at the age of 17, he enlisted in the Rhode Island National Guard during the Korean conflict to join his peers in doing his part to serve America. A year later, he switched to active duty and was sent to location in Japan as a military policeman. As co-chair of the U.S. Army Hawaii Retiree Council for more than three decades, he has provided invaluable service to our retiree families and as a result facilitated an understanding by them of the ever-improving and changing medical delivery systems we employ. Madam Speaker, I ask you to join me as we offer our gratitude today to a man that has dedicated his life to service to our country. Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The lady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Consent to address the House for one minute. And the gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, it's deja vu all over again. Here we are just two weeks, five legislative days away from sequestration. And yet the House is about to leave town for a nine-day recess. That's unacceptable. We should be working every day to avoid this sequester and to avert it. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle seem determined to make sequestration a reality. Democrats stand ready to work in a bipartisan manner to avoid this. Yesterday I met with federal employees, college leaders from Michigan, who are deeply concerned about how these cuts will affect middle class families, students, and senior citizens. Here's sequestration by the numbers. 750,000 jobs eliminated by October. 20% reduction in the Pentagon's operating budget. 70,000 children kicked out of Head Start. 21,000 fewer food and drug inspections. 4 million fewer meals served through the senior nutrition programs. 
We need to find a balanced and responsible approach to reduce our deficit for sure, but not let irrational across-the-board cuts take effect. Doing so will devastate this economic recovery. Madam Speaker, I yield back the remainder of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? The gentleman is recognized with unanimous consent. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I join in concern about our budget. The National Institute of Health would be cut in a major way. When I was a child, I had polio, and it has effects on people who had polio in later years. But because of the federal government's investment in research, the Salk vaccine and the Sabin vaccine saved many families and children from that devastating disease. And around the world it's been successful too. There are other diseases like heart disease, Alzheimer's, cancer, that the National Institute of Health is primarily responsible for research. And it's health that I'm worried about and it's also jobs. And the major drivers of jobs is research and development and education and infrastructure spending by the federal government. And most of our great advances, whether it's railroads or the internet or health care, have come through federal government partnerships with private sector. We need to continue those to create a middle class, a consumers that can grow our economy out of these problems. It's not just President Obama who says it. It's what I call the three wise men, Krugman, Stieglitz, and Robert Reich. Austerity hasn't worked. We need to invest in America and grow our economy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? The gentlelady is recognized. I thank the Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, more and more the voices are being raised about <laughs> the devastating impact of a sequester, a self-inflicted wound of this Congress because we could not come together as the American people have directed us to do. Security of the United States will be in jeopardy if we have the sequester. Men and women who stand on the front lines in protecting this nation will be in jeopardy. All of those who depend upon Head Start funding, early education funding, and Title I funds, and housing funds, opportunities for young people to go to college will be in jeopardy. And so I think it is unfortunate that we are discussing and debating on the floor today H.R. 273 to eliminate the 2013 statutory pay adjustment for federal employees. All of those people who put themselves on the line for us who have already had a pay freeze, and all we're talking about is a 0 0.5 or 0 0.05. None of that will bring down the debt or help the deficit. We're just making noise. What we should be doing is focusing on coming together around a growth and innovation budget and bringing the deficit down. What we should be doing is honoring the Sandy Hook and other victims and passing real gun prevention, gun violence prevention, universal background checks, storing guns. Madam Speaker, let us do the job the American people sent us to do. I yield back. General Lady's time's expired. And pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until approximately 1.30. And when the House comes back at 1.30 Eastern, they'll begin work on a bill to continue the